I'm Doug Schwartz and I'm a digger. <laughs> we're going to walk and then we're going to start talking. Careful uh, the mole holes here. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Pretty quick one. No, you, they don't have to be quick. I'm an archaeologist. What is a hundred years for me? In 1932, a group from the East, I think they were from Connecticut, came out here for a vacation. They looked around and this is great. We could set up a dairy here. <laughs> so now what their thought was, you know, this is an arroyo. There's water coming down here from the mountains. They bought uh, 500 acres. And uh, they decided what they do is to dam the arroyo and then bring an irrigation ditch along the edge right over here. And they found uh, some dirt piled up. What they found was a room block over here and they took that room block and they moved it over here and they made an irrigation pond. The first big storm that came out of the mountain cut out their dam completely, just decimated the dam. A board member of what was then the School of American Research, which is now the School for Advanced Research, who was a lawyer, Parker Wilson, he said, wait a minute, I'm handling this bankruptcy, and why don't you, as a public uh, gift, give 20 acres, that is this old archaeological site, which was discovered by Adolf Bandelier, not excavated, but just discovered, and uh, then they can preserve that. As a result of a bankruptcy and a flood, this was retained by the school till after we excavated it, and then we gave it to the Archaeological Conservancy. We started up here at that top. We, had, we didn't know it was down here, and uh, took the top six inches off and found those walls, mm -hmm. and then uh, dug down between the walls till we got to the floor. And the floors were just so clear, they were so hard, and we had fire pits in them and so forth. Okay, we've got that all. What do we do next? Well, I wonder what's down there. So we dug a pit in the floor, and that square pit was our excavation to look down. And pretty soon, we went all the way down and found that earlier occupation. That was a very important uh, issue for us. What were their agricultural practices? And uh, we thought we were going to be able to do that. And I had uh, one team which was dedicated just to looking for those things. Uh, about two weeks into our work here, there was one of our great summer thunderstorms, huge thunderstorm. <laughs> that water came out of the uh, mountains and into the arroyo, and it roared down there like it was the Mississippi. And I realized that's been going on for 600 years. It had wiped out any evidence of their farming activity, unfortunately. So even though we looked, we don't have that much systematic excavation. And as I said, you know, we'll answer these questions when everything's excavated and we can compare all of this. We don't have that. This is the only big Pueblo that was built in 50 years. Uh, there hadn't been one excavated of this nature for 50 years. And as I was saying to somebody, that, that was Pecos, excavated in 1917. And 50 years later, uh, when we excavated this, tremendous increase in archaeological technology and ability to understand things. Uh, Kidder, who, who was a fantastic archaeologist, excavated Pecos, they never thought of recovering the grains of purslane or the turkey bones. And we found uh, coops 
where turkeys were raised. We found the pottery dishes where turkeys uh, got water and there, all kinds of things emerged like the pollen and the archaeomagnetism, the magnetic direction of iron in fireplaces, which gave us some indication of what the age was. That com Kiva complex that's off to the west, and we'll see that when we get up here. We're down here for a particular reason. Uh, why was that? And of course, the answer is we don't know. Now, uh, on the other hand, if you look at Pueblo ethnography and Pueblo history, they are so contentious. They're always fighting with one another. There's always somebody on the inside and somebody on the outside. And I think it's a reasonable guess that those were people on the outside. Okay, we want to come and live with you. We know it's safer, but we know we're in the wrong clan. Uh, we know that uh, uh, our ancestors came from too far to the east. And so we won't be right next to you. We'd we like to be close. We don't know. And it's really an interesting question. You see this hill right behind us? That has a two-story adobe wall in it. And I'm going to show you a place further on. When we finished, what we did is we took plastic and we put it at the base of each of those room, the floors, which are beautiful, hard clay floors. Then we covered it with dirt. And then we, uh, you wouldn't know it, uh, but we uh, put uh, grass seed over the whole thing. So, and if it rains, it would be fine here, but this is tough. But one section of the Pueblo that we had excavated, I left uncovered because I wanted to see how long it would take for those walls to decay uh, with wind and with rain. Now, they didn't have any roofs on them, but it appeared at the end of the first settlement as they were contracting back, and of course what you have to think about is they were living here in, in, right around the Pueblo. And so they went out and they collected wood that first year right there. And then the second year they had to go out a little bit further and then they chopped. They had to cut 6,000 logs in order to make roofs here. So if you can imagine they were decimating the environment around them. Uh, there's a, a long-standing feeling that Native Americans are in tune with their environment. No, they're not any more tuned than we are. They've got to make a living. And so they're, they're, they're chopping the trees down, they're killing the deer, and they have to go further and further out. One of the kivas over here, it's just a huge, big, those were ponderosa. Um, using stone tools is a long process. And they only had one other thing that would help them, and that was fire. And it appears as if, okay, this is a good pole to use. So we'll light a fire down here and we'll weaken that. And then we will chip it out with our stone axes and then we get down to the really tough stuff, we'll burn some more. Uh, we really don't know, but if we look cross-culturally at other early farming, I was uh, in southern Ethiopia uh, with a, a group that was living just at this level. And that's, what, that's the kind of thing that they were doing. And if you look at the historic Pueblo, the earliest historic pictures of Pueblos, big Pueblos, which I showed some, there are no entrances on the ground floor. If you look later in time and you go to the Pueblos now, there are entrances on the ground floor. They wanted it to be inconvenient for anybody who might attack them. So uh, the idea is it's inconvenient, but you take a ladder, you put it up there, you go up the ladder, then you pull the ladder up. So what's happening is you are restricting access because you have outer walls. You're restricting access because you have a gate. 
But if they get through that, you're restricting access by pulling up the ladder. They're doing everything to make each step harder and harder to get in. But it'll be uh, more clear when we get up top, and I'll point out the whole orientation of the Pueblo. So let's go. Their place, that first hamlet leader said, let's move and let's find a place that maybe we can protect and maybe we can see if anybody's coming. Look at this view around here. It is spectacular. Uh, that circular structure, which I call the community structure, uh, is right over there. You can see a little post with a sign there. That's approximately where it is. So you can see it's really off to the side of everything. <clears throat> now, if you look over this way, that, that mound right at the edge of the arroyo, that's where we found that masonry, those masonry rooms. And that is the beginning of the site, right there. They built that 1300 right above the spring, and then very rapidly, it looks like they filled in these other three room blocks. This was the first compound, as I said, this provided the template for the rest of the Pueblo. On the other hand, it didn't because it simply duplicated an old uh, hamlet. And were, all the rest of these are just added on. In terms of excavation, it's the earliest that's shown with excavation detail. But there haven't been enough of these excavated to know if that's the case. I think from the standpoint of the uh, change in the climate, uh, this happens just coincident with that. And it's very easy to imagine with the climate changing, this was the first and bam, there were copycats all over there. They said, this is a great idea. So here's the first plaza. The other plazas first were built along this arroyo because the spring is right down there and they wanted to be as close as possible to it. So they built to the south. And then as it expanded, as I said, they built three more plazas. All of those were just adjacent to the west. And it's almost better, once you have that, to look at the front page because by that time we knew where everything was. So you got these three plazas to the west with their gates away from the uh, spring. Perhaps you can see that. And they had to... Then they began building this way. They stayed close to the arroyo. They stayed close to uh, the back wall of an existing compound but they moved that way, not too far. And then, if you look over in that direction right there, is where the outliers were. We started here and we put a test trench <laughs> right through the plaza, and it turned out we found the kiva and we found the gate. Then when we worked over here in the smaller plaza, we excavated the whole plaza. And we found all of the, we found burials, we found shrines, we found turkey uh, coops, and a tremendous insight into what was going on in the Pueblo. This is sort of a protective side. If you were going to try to protect yourself, this is a good way to do it. There's almost constant water down there. Right now, you'd have to go down in there and find little ponds of it, but it's there. This is not where they farmed, however. If they planted down here, the first flood would wash it out. So if you follow the arroyo down, you would see where the arroyo just opens up and is flat. And that's where the 2,000 acres of farmland is. I did uh, a lot of work in the Grand Canyon. That was the first major area I worked. 
is an eastern city boy coming out there and looking into the canyon and my god how did people ever live there about halfway through the first summer i was working on the south rim and then i talked to a ranger because i said uh, where do you work he said i work down in the bottom of the bright angel oh i said you're up here on vacation he said no i came up last night uh, oh, oh oh you're coming up for vacation he said no i'm going back down today I said, why'd you come up? He said, there was a dance. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a, it's a different perspective. And so they would have thought nothing of doing that. We're walking through the gate, the first gate, and it couldn't have been positioned more effectively in terms of getting down to the spring, which is right down there. When we left that, that area, uh, there were six foot high standing adobe walls. And uh, we left about four rooms open, as I said, to see how long it took them to erode. And I was interested in what it would have been like coming back at the second occupation. And uh, within 15 years, they were essentially gone. What I have given you here on the front, a little bit of that reconstruction that I used during the talk. The next page is the first reconstruction that we made at the end of the first year of excavation. So we had a lot to learn, but still it's a good orientation, but that's not the complete Pueblo. The next page gives you some sense of what the total Pueblo is like, including at the top, the uh, casino. And you'll notice down here, there is, at the bottom left, there's a marked in what had been another plaza. That's the one that was torn out to make the dam for the dairy irrigation. The next page is the second occupation. And if you compare that second page to the first page, the first occupation of the second, you'll see that it really, it's almost just three little uh, hamlets. I have a list of the publications that we did. And each publication focuses on one major topic, ecology, uh, climate change through dendrochronology, architecture, pottery, uh, survey of what is in this area, uh, an analysis of the difference between access in the first occupation as opposed to the second occupation. But each one of those also has subsidiary reports on feathers, bone, stone, textiles, pollen, and, and so forth.